separate view, the Nobel Prize winners. We thought, why, we thought why not doing it here and also giving you the opportunity to ask questions. The idea is, so we have again, similar to what we did with George uh, when he was here. This is Sertman International Symposium. This is quasi-crystal physics uh, and chemistry. But on, on the other side, we have a Nobel Prize winner in a different field, in life sciences. Uh, so uh, we are bringing them together. And what links us together is not just a publication, scientific publication, but is a broader view of, the, of, uh, of our world. So we have an organic and non-organic non I mean, inorganic issues here. Uh, so uh, what about the publication? We spoke about publication yesterday. So uh, you heard Randy saying that uh, it, it, it's, uh, we should go away, we should modify the system of peer review, uh, how this can be applied uh, in our exact sciences. How can it be implied in? Uh, applied in our field. In oh, exact material science, science, you mean? Material science, chemistry, physics. I, I do not agree with Randy. I think really? that uh, peer review is very important. No, I, it's I don't important, but he's saying that we're doing it differently. Oh, ah, okay. Yeah. He's uh, saying may, that may, maybe so. Yes? Oh, yeah, of course. Peer review is crucial. Yes. It's the, it, the question in my mind is who makes the decision exactly. uh, about what gets published after, uh, first of all, who makes the decision about which papers are going to be reviewed, right. and then who makes the decision about the comments that are made by active scientists? And I feel at the high end, I don't know about material science, but I imagine there are high-end papers in nature and science and material in, in your field. Um, but but my, my challenge is when uh, professional editors who ha are, have not been in the laboratory for decades are the ones making the decision. What are the criteria that they're using to make that decision? And I, and I assert that it's often based on their judgment of whether the paper is going to generate a lot of citations. And that, I think, is the flaw. Yeah, I agree with you on that. Uh, you see, when I sent the first paper on quasi-periodic materials to a journal of applied physics, it was rejected before review. They didn't yeah. send it for review. And they wrote me a polite, very short letter we, we, we will not uh, send it for review because we feel that it will not interest the community of physicists. So said the editor. And that was uh, the end of that. And I sent it to another journal and then it was accepted. But, uh, but you're right. And, and the, uh, the reviews are sometimes excellent and sometimes yeah. much less than that, yeah. to say the least. So it's a, yeah, it's a mixed. A uh, mixed uh, system. One thing that, that I like very much, by the way, is the following. After the fiasco of, uh, of um, poly water, in which many uh, top universities were involved, many instituted an internal peer review. And NBS is one of these places that I know, but I know that other universities have the same. It means the following, you cannot send the paper out from your institute unless your peers in, your, your colleagues, uh, checked it, that it's reasonable, well-written, and so on. I think that is an excellent system because for once, they're not hiding behind closed doors. You know who they are. They come to your office after they have read your paper and say, hey, Danny, you know, I would, I would do the following, this and this and this, this is not a good sentence, here we miss some information, and they do it for free. We do it for each other for free. Free means that you don't have to put their names on the paper, and, and they help you write a better paper. I, I am all for this system, although for some people it sounds like a terrible burden, but I think, I think it's a good idea. Uh, maybe it can be instituted well, in other well, institutions. Um, it could be, but you know, the problem is when you have people who are serving as reviewers who you know, their colleagues and friends, they may not be entirely honest with you when, when they have to confront you with what they may consider to be uh, inadequate work. So I, I think there's a value to having anonymous peer review as long as, uh, as, long as the people who are making the decision on the basis of their views are 
our uh, active scholars and, and, and uh, you know, honest brokers. So who do you suggest should buy the Fallon Museum? Well, I think, uh, my personal view is that I, I would always rather have uh, uh, an active scholar making the, making the decision as opposed to a, one of these so-called professional editors. And, and that, I think, is a problem with, with uh, journals like Science and Nature, particularly Nature, where the entire staff uh, making all the decisions are not only long since having been in the laboratory, most of them on the, uh, in the employ of nature have never published a paper when they were active in nature. So I, I think the standards and their judgment are questionable. Now I don't know about the journal that you had this experience with at the outset of your discovery. How, that, that may have been a judgment of, of an active scholar, I don't know. Yeah, so it could of be. Could of course, be you know, those are... Sent for the yeah. review. I mean, it is exactly what you are yeah, saying. It, it was not sent for review. Yeah, but, but who, who made that decision? It was the editor of the uh, journal of applied physics. Yeah, but is, is he an active scholar or is he simply an employee of the journal? It's him. He, he signed it. I, I know that. I know that. But is he a, is he an, was he an active scientist or was he just... <laughs> oh, I don't, I don't know. That's, that's, I don't know. Yeah. Not, I'm, I'm, an, I'm an editor too, but I run a laboratory, so yeah. I, yeah. my judgment is based on my experience with, in the laboratory and not on my experience as a journalist. But on the other side, suppose we go to the review. The reviewer is a, is a scientist. You are coming a completely, a totally new idea. He, his judgment is subjective. He cannot repeat experiments. Even if he wants, he'll take time and really he cannot, he cannot just verify everything. So in this point of view, you cannot simply reject a paper just because you cannot repeat the experiment yourself. Yeah. So in that point of view, probably I'm asking you, shouldn't we be a little bit more relaxed in this area and to leave the time to see if it is a scientific blunder or it is not a scientific yeah. blunder? Well, that, okay, so I addressed that yesterday as well. Um, the journals at the very high end, and I don't know about the journal of, was this the Journal of Applied Physics, did you say, was it? Was that the, the journal? journal? was JAP. Journal of Applied Physics. Yeah. The, the problem at the high end is that journals that uh, cater to this impact factor um, make, uh, in artificially restrict the number of papers that they will publish. And, um, and so when a journal like Nature, which accepts only 8% of their submissions, or Science, which accepts only 6%, 6%, in the end, the, you know, they can make capricious decisions on the basis of the whim of the editor. And that, that, I think, is a problem. And that's a problem whether it's the, the decision is made by an active scientist or, or by a professional editor. So I think journals should be somewhat more inclusive and be willing to take risks when something controversial crosses their desk. But at the high end, uh, they, they, they're not taking risks except when they make decisions to accept papers that are s seemingly sensational, like the example that I mentioned yesterday, <clears throat> the stem cell paper that is probably just fraud. Well, I think the problem is that the best uh, reviewers are too busy to review papers. Yeah, well, there's that exactly. too. So, uh, probably we should pass to, to the other uh, question that I had in mind. So, life sciences and, I mean, the life sciences and uh, material sciences, chemistry and so on, uh, what they have together, what, what divides them, what, the, what brings them together besides publications? Well, um, I think as a community, we all have an interest in promoting basic science in investigator-initiated, uh, not top-down managed science, where the investigator is able to explore his or her own curiosity in choosing a problem that is a, a, is a fundamental problem. And I see uh, increasingly in the US and, and elsewhere that governments want to manage science. They want to tell us what to do. They want to direct us to do things that they consider of practical benefit when, in fact, for a basic scientist like me, my decisions are 
best made when I'm able to choose my own directions and not you know, be directed to work on drug discovery, for example. And you, you may feel the same way. I think you know, practical research should be done, in the, my feeling is, should be done in the private sector. And that we in universities and research institutes should be free to pursue our own creative instinct. Well, who, who is dictating? Who, who, is, who is suggesting? The government who is agencies. The government agencies increasingly yeah. in, in the United US. States, yeah. in the government. And they now, even the ones that were funding fundamental science, now require applications. Yeah. You have to show what is it. What, and this is how we work. So, what we do is get money to perform applied research, which we do, and in between look for the fundamentals uh, and look for discoveries. This is how quasi periodic materials have been discovered. I was, I was sponsored by DARPA to develop uh, aluminum alloys for aerospace uh, applications, and there it was. So, we should, well, but the government takes decisions. They have some advisor. These are, are these scientists or just bureaucrats? Who, who takes a decision on the area where we should go? Who decides the, 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 the broader, the broader? Uh, who makes the decisions what to study? I can I tell mean, you, like, and I can tell you where it's done. Huh? It is DARPA. DARPA makes the decision in uh, what is one done once a year in um, in the south in the south of California. In uh, what was the name of the city with the harbor? San Diego. San Diego. In San Diego, California, La Jolla. They have a school there, which is nicely uh, occupied with huge computer. They gather once a year and they make decisions what they will sponsor. And this is like an order from the Vatican, and everybody follows. It's amazing. It is amazing. Are they scientists? Are they yeah, no, engineers? they're good. They're good people, and they invite scientists. They they, they interview. They interview all of us. Come for an hour, and we go. I come for an hour and tell us what do you think about this? What do you think about that? Should this? Process? They consult, but 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 the white smoke comes from there. This is at least my experience in the field of material science. I don't know about other fields. Well, sciences. in the life sciences in the U.S., it's primarily. Uh, the, the major funding agency is the NIH, NIH. and uh, at least in, in the past, the tradition has been to foster, to favor basic science. But increasingly, uh, po possibly because of government oversight, the director of the NIH, who is a, you know, is a great scientist, who was very important in his career, increasingly he's earmarking funds for what in, in the life sciences referred to as translational research, you know, where investigators are asked to dr do drug screening trials in their laboratory. And I think this, not only do I feel that this is a misapplication of precious resources, but even the pharmaceutical industry doesn't think that we in, in the laboratories and universities are well equipped to do this kind of work. We are not well equipped. We aren't making practical decisions. Whereas the, you know, the pharmaceutical industry, when they decide to pursue a, a, a target, they, they make a lot of practical decisions about whether that's feasible. And, and uh, so I think, I think I said this last night, I think it's, uh, you know, we should be allowed to do what we're good at and, and, and the practical application should be done primarily in the private sector. So it's private sector who should push and this is what happened in environmental issues also. It's, uh, it's coming mostly from top down, from the government down, instead of uh, the government rarely consult the industries and academics and so on. And then they come with a criteria, for example, uh, we should decrease CO2 at this level, which sometimes even not, even not possible physically. So this is happening everywhere, actually. Yeah, no, I'm sure it is. I'm sure so it is. That's why we should, go, we should push from bottom up in order. That's the purpose to having to all these politicians that we involved with our conference. That's have been our goal from the start. Sure. That's why you are here, because the goal is to bring all the sciences together in order to be sustainable, although we are in a different field. Mm -hmm. uh, well, now just to pass to a different uh, issue. So uh, you got Frey International Sustainability Award. Frey is a scientist, he's here. And you got 
Shetman International Leadership Award. Okay, these are scientific awards. I don't, I'm wondering, in the Nobel Prize, who decides, are scientists or are bureaucrats? Well, it's scientists. Scientists. Scientists, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that means we are doubling Nobel Prize here. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but what is important, we are giving scientific awards to politicians. And they, they appreciate more prizes coming from scientists than their peers from politics to politics. You know, regarding awards, I, I always wondered what, what is it that makes the Nobel Prize so much number one and away, far away from any second prize in the world? And, and I have many, many reasons. Tell us this. I have tell many, us this. I, can, I can tell you many things, but not one thing that makes it totally supreme. I would say the history. I mean, it's been going on for uh, 110 years, lo much longer than any, any of the other awards. So, uh, and, and of course, as you know, the Swedes put, put on quite a spectacle, <laughs> more than anything else that I've ever experienced. And uh, for them, it's like their, uh, their Super Bowl. So the whole country is given over to this in a way that I've never seen for other awards. So, but I would say the history is really and, and that all. It's not only it's not only Sweden, not only Stockholm, and I can tell you, and you know it very well. For many years, the amount of money in the prize was such that it was sufficient for a for a flight to Stockholm. It was a minuscule amount of money, yeah. and still, it was number one. It, yeah. It's not related to the amount of money. There are much larger prizes in oh, terms yeah. of money. I don't even know them. Uh, you don't hear about. Yeah. And the Nobel somehow succeeded. There is the Wolf Prize, which I chair. So we are happy to say that one third of our awardees get the Nobel Prize later on. Later. Still later on. Not yeah. <laughs> no, you don't. Before. <laughs> And in the U.S., there's uh, the Lasker Prize in, in biomedical science, which is uh, the biggest, m most successful prize in the U.S. In, in, in life sciences. But even so, they often, just as you said, they compare themselves to the Nobel, how many who win the Lasker go on to win. Uh, so every, everyone is, is comparing themselves to the Nobel. Right. So that's why. That, yeah. Maybe that's why, by reflection, the Nobel is... Is, is everyone agrees is, is the most prestigious one. Somehow, maybe, maybe because they managed to attract a lot of media. They're very successful. It's Friedrich itself. They, they attract the media, the media is interested. Yeah. People are waiting around the world oh, yeah. for the moment to see who yeah. is getting it. And yeah. there's no other prize like this. No, no. Somehow, maybe because it's a fairy tale. You know, the, yeah. the ceremony with the king and the queen and the princess and the yeah. prince <laughs> in the palace. And I don't know what it is. Yeah, and, and, and of course, they do good work. And you may not know it, but hundreds of people are involved and they know who the winner is and nobody talks. Mm -hmm. The hall, a Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences is involved. There are hundreds of members. They all know who the winner is, and they don't talk. Yeah. Well, this it's in the wonderful. Swedish personality, you know. They're very uh, phlegmatic is the term. They, they don't talk much. <laughs> so in, uh, so in, in, this, uh, in this direction, uh, on Monday we had George here, and I did a question. I couldn't find a picture of yours when you were young, actually. But I showed two young pictures there when you were very young, he and George. And I, the question I ask, I'm repeating here. So you, would you prefer to be young like that or to be at this age with a Nobel Prize? <laughs> <laughs> that's not, that's not. Uh, well, In some yeah, ways, in some ways, yeah. In some ways, it, it would be good to be young again and to be, uh, have that much energy and, you know, and, and, the, and those aspirations. And now I find that my time is no longer my own. <laughs> I get called on to do all kinds of things that take away from my science. Exactly. That's the last, uh, last uh, subject. How your life changed when you became awardees, Nobel awardees. 
how it changed your life when you, you got the Nobel Award? It changed my life completely. I don't know about Randy, but my yeah. life was just... I was, I was doing many things before. I traveled a lot, I was invited. And I can tell you that when they announced the prize on the phone, they called me and told me, I had half an hour before the rest of the world knows. So besides calling my wife, I didn't tell anybody and I was you just were, sitting there. You were in Israel? What I was in my office at the Technion, okay. working on the computer and the telephone rings and I said, Danny speaking in Hebrew, with a bell, Danny, hello, <laughs> this is the Royal Swedish Academy of Science, and so on. So I, I, I just, I was sitting there, looking at the floor, in front of my desk, thinking what will happen now. I didn't even imagine what was going to happen. It was so far away from reality what, what, I, what I thought will happen. I thought I'll have, oh, I'll have some more invitations and oh, maybe I get more money for research. So. Nothing like that. All my time is now taken in, in meetings and lectures and uh, every initiative that I start works and people are happy to, to help. And uh, oh, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing what happens. To How much time is left to yourself? I mean, for family. Oh, well, you know, uh, I, I am on, in, it's, it's, I feel that I'm in a mission to, to push okay. Okay. education in the world and uh, technological entrepreneurship in the world and so. Yeah. And what Things about that you? I did before, but, but yeah. now I have more power to do that. Yeah, I'll, I'll mention a little bit. I, I have to mention that. But uh, in order to, to continue the, the question, so what about you? Well, I, um, when they called me, it was in the middle of the night. I know. Why are they called all the time like this? Well, they well, figured they. Three a.m. in the morning. They, all well, the it was actually 1:20 in the morning. It could be whatever. <laughs> uh, I guess they figure people would would like to know, even if they're awakened in the middle of the night. <laughs> so, uh, I my the phone rang. My wife heard it at first, and she yelled out, "This is it!" <laughs> of course, normally when you get a phone call at 1:20 in the morning. It's bad news, right? Yeah. <laughs> but, but on this particular day, at that particular moment, when people are telling you for years ahead of time, in my case, they've been telling me for many years, I, I sort of knew that it might be when I heard the phone ring. So then uh, I had about an hour and a half before the press conference in Stockholm. And that may have been the most peaceful hour and a half that I've had since then because no one else knew and I had the luxury of being able to call my father and my, my children and friends. But then at uh, 2.30 in the morning in California, uh, I had two press officers from my university in my home lining up the TV camera crews <laughs> and it was, it, it, it was chaos. And uh, it, like, like uh, we heard, it's uh, it's, it's a life-changing experience. But I will say, you have, you have to make a decision, I would say, when, when this happens, about whether you want it to take over your life to do good things, or, or if you actually would prefer to do what you did in the past. And there are some people who have the resolve to just say no and continue to do their work. Um, uh, there are, uh, my graduate advisor, at Stanford it was a man named Arthur Kornberg, really a brilliant biochemist. He won the Nobel Prize when he was 40 years old. So it was very early, still early in his career, and he didn't want it to interfere with his science. And so um, he just said no to almost everything. Lectures, no. Uh, interviews, no. No, I'm here to do science. And so it's, you could do that. But very few people do. <laughs> and the, um, the other question I was when, when George was here is that, uh, well, with the Nobel Prize, probably you see life difference. What's the meaning of life? You gave the response. I asked, I'm asking him first. Then I'm going back to you if I have a different reply now. What's the meaning of life? He is going to respond first and then after. 
meaning of life? Of life. What, is, what is the meaning of life? Yes, at this stage when you are with a Nobel Prize. Oh, I see. Okay, I thought you were asking a philosophic question. It's a philosophical uh -huh. kind of question. Well, of course, I believe that life is is uh, complex chemistry. So I don't, no, I, I don't, mean, I don't, I don't, I, I don't believe in any not spiritual, in scientific, yeah, I exact see. scientific meaning, in a real meaning of the word. I mean, yeah. Well, I think like Danny, I, I, I have not said no to many things. I've said yes because I have certain things about which I feel very strongly. One is this publication business that I've discussed. But also, in the US, I feel very strongly about public higher education, which is under challenge throughout the US. In the states like California, where um, uh, public higher education used to be considered a public good, an investment in the future. But it has now become a private commodity where students are expected to make the investment in themselves rather than the public investing in, in, in the future generations. And I, I think this is a terrible transition. And so I've used my moment in the spotlight to, to broadcast that issue. I've spoken out uh, to the university community. I've been to the state legislature to argue on behalf of the university. And to the extent that anyone listens to me, I make the case that this is a change that has to be reversed somehow. And it's not just California. Uh, it's throughout the US. Every state institution that used to be publicly supported has cut back. Really, states have abandoned public higher education in the US. And it's a, t it's a terrible. It's a terrible change. So I'm, I feel strongly about using the, my influence for, uh, for that fight. So meaning of, as if I uh, translated correctly, meaning of life is achieving the goals. You got Nobel Prize, but you're, you have lots of things to do and to achieve, well, correct? Well, it's, it's not just achieving goals. It's using the, the influence that comes with that award to try to effect change. And the change that I, I want to affect is to restore public universities to their traditional role as engines of social mobility, which now, you know, in the US, the largest debt owed by any group of citizens is owed by college graduates who are indebted to uh, universities and other agencies to the tune of something like $1.4 trillion dollars. There's more public debt from, from university graduates than there is credit card debt. The accumulated student debt is greater than credit card debt in the US. And it's all because uh, the enormous increase in tuition expenses at universities, and particularly because states have systematically abandoned their role in public higher education. This is, I think this is, this is, the most serious challenge to the leadership position that the U.S. has had in science and technology. That's why they call Obama at 3 o'clock when he got the Nobel Prize. They called Obama at 3 o'clock in the morning? Uh, they did the same thing. Well, they called, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I think it's probably difficult for anyone to get through to Obama directly. <laughs> so to finish with you, so your symposium, what's the meaning of life in your terms? You'll be disappointed. I think that, that my definition of the meaning of life, first of all, I don't think it's a legitimate question, but let's assume it is a legitimate question. Then it, uh, it is a, 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 a set of intricate chemical reactions. This is life. And, but the point, is, the point is that most people do not accept it this way, and they, they seek uh, some other meaning. So let me suggest to you one thing that you may want to consider. And uh, let's say that life is the greatest gift that you will ever receive. And think about what were the prospects, what was the chance that you would be born? Another sperm is your brother or sister, not you. You wouldn't know that you were not born. Okay? So. You can, you can count all the imaginary sperm and so on and so on. 
and you come up with a very, very minute number. Multiply that by the chances of your father to be born and multiply that by the chances of your mother to be born. And you go back to the first molecules that created life. Is this zero or what? <laughs> and yet, you are here. What a gift. Excellent. <laughs> but still probabilistic, and that's true. That's true. So with this is a high note. We, we finish this, uh, uh, this uh, conversation, we can call it. And uh, we thank you very much. We wish you. Um, oh, if somebody has a question, sure. Use the microphone. Uh, he, he, she cannot. Uh, uh, Claude, can you? Uh, you know. Uh, good morning to all of you, and it's, it was a very interesting discussion. But as participants, we also would like to take part in asking or sending some of our comments uh, relevant to the discussions which you had. Well, first of all, regarding the publication, a very important paper was review, uh, refused by the reviewers. But the editor of the journal that was Nature at that time, in 1928, published it anyway. And you wouldn't believe who it was. That was Sir C.V. Raman, who was my great uncle. And his paper, Raman Effect, was published anyway by the Nature editor. And you can imagine, instantly, within two years, he got the Nobel Prize. So this shows the effect of reviewers. Reviewing a paper, rejecting it. A very important paper. It was rejected on the basis that, aha, this is not any new effect. It must be some impurity in your solution, which produced this uh, shift, Raman shift. Well, anyway, the editor said, well, OK, never mind. So I shall publish it, and let me see what the public will say. So that's one instance which I would like to quote. And uh, there are many, many more. I mean, in my own case, I am not a Raman, but uh, many of my papers were also rejected. But then at any, it was published by other journals, which was appreciated. And they said, please send us more papers. OK. I don't want to go into those details. But then, about the present day situation of the tsunami of papers which are being sent for publication to pub uh, publishers. That's it is also uh, that the grant giving yeah. system uh, narrows down the subjects so that there's such a multi uh, sections of papers so, in sorry, so I many hate, fields. I hate to interrupt. But as I said, we are short of time. Yeah. So if you, it's very po a good point. Can you, uh, the question, if you had a question or is it a comment? It's a comment and question as well. Okay. The point is, I would like to. Keep it short because yeah, we, we yeah. have a program okay. to go. Okay. Uh, I would like to say that uh, it is very, very difficult to find an appropriate referee for the particular work which you do because not everybody is acquainted with what you are doing. So this is a very difficult question. So my own suggestion is that the paper should be classified by editors in two categories. One can be put in a discussion section, section where you can invite public reviewing so that after a few months, if it is not reviewed, either plus or minus, the people can judge for themselves the merit of the paper. I mean, I have more, but I will stop at this because I'm not, I don't want to take uh, your time. Thanks very much. So who is going to take? Oh, it's just a comment. There's no well, comment. I, uh, there is. Um, in the physical sciences, there is the physics archive, which just posts essentially anything. And that seems to work in the physical sciences. People have their work posted, and there is a, offers their public comments that can come in. And that works. It's a, you know, a model of post-publication review that is being attempted to some extent in the life sciences. But it may, it may not be as successful in the life sciences because there are a lot of things that get published that have commercial implications and therefore they have to be protected and, and posting them on something like an open source website just won't work for those things of commercial value. But it works in the, phys in the physical science community and that's, so that may be the solution that would have been the solution 
to the paper that you described by Raman. Post it, just post it online, not, not that you could do that in the 1930s, post it online and, and then after a period of time people will recognize how important it was. Never mind reviewing it beforehand. That could work. You have another question? Yep, I have a very simple question <clears throat> to the two Nobel laureates. Have you tried to publish your data in high impact factor journals or did you publish where you think the paper is best suited? Try holding the microphone. Oh, closer. sorry, again. Oh, the question is simple. Have you tried to publish your results in high impact factor journals or did you decide to publish where the paper is maybe best suited? Yeah, I heard the question. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, uh, the decision is, how do you decide whether to publish in a high-impact factor journal or in a specialty journal where it will be read by your colleagues? That's the decision. That's the question. And um, that's a good question. Um, sometimes the work that may have broader implications than one's own, own field should be in a in a general science journal so that other scientists have a chance to, uh, to read and, uh, and uh, appreciate the work. Whereas if it's published in a, you know, a society journal that focuses on, let's say, material science, then scholars in, in other areas would not, would not know about it. So that, um, it's, a, it's a personal decision. Uh, some people like to appeal to a broader audience. I was the editor of the, of the PNAS, which of course covers all of sciences, and um, there are often articles in different fields in, in, in that journal that are, that are appealing to, to others. And um, I, so I think there's a place for, for both kinds of journals. I would say that uh, the answer depends on what stage in your career, academic career you are. If you are about to be promoted, then go for high impact because they look at it. If you are established, write for your peers, wherever you want. Any more questions? So this is Nobel Prize exception. We are going. Yeah, microphone is right at hand here. <laughs> Thank uh, I would not take too much time. Just a short question to excellent scientists, Nobel Prize winners. How do you consider the important ingredients of success in science? It's what is the most important? The combination, constellation of several uh, synergetic factors. Yourself. This is the ingenuity and the bright ideas from your mind. Your colleagues your technical background, your sponsorship, your, your financial background. What, what is the most important to get success in science? Thank you. This was from Frank Hungary. We, we are. I, don't, I don't think there's one answer to that question. I think, uh, in my case, having ambitious, brilliant students was crucial. Uh, and uh, in addition, I think a personal quality that I feel is very important is the ability to focus and not be distracted by lots of other things. I, I, I know some brilliant people who are dilettantes and they dabble in this and that. And uh, they may be effective, but they will never make really profound discoveries, I think. And, and then exploit those discoveries to dig deeper into a problem. So for me, the most important personal quality is, is to have passionate focus. No, I, I, I'm on the other side. Okay. I think that, uh, at least in my case, I never focused on one thing more than five years. And uh, I moved from subject to subject. Let, let me, but let me give you an example from industry that you know very well, and you'll see that there are several ways to succeed. Let's take two companies that you all know. Take Intel and take Samsung. Intel is like Randy. They focus, focus, focus. They make chips, they make certain chips, and this is their business. And they are very successful. Look at Samsung. You need a cell phone? They got it for you. You need a refrigerator? 
They make refrigerator, television, they make television. Do you need a ship? They have shipyards. You need a hospital? They have hospitals. By the way, do you need an insurance company? They have insurance company. They are diverse. They will do anything that, may, that brings money. Are they successful? Yeah, they're successful. Scientists are the same way. There are characters, Crandy, who focuses, characters like me, who look for different things and try to find uh, things uh, here and there and everywhere. But, but the main, but what common is, number one, be an expert in something, like Randy and like me, and be very serious about your science. That's, that's of course, common. As the entrepreneurship uh, second profession of Professor Shetman that we really didn't touch during this symposium, he is, is a strong promoter of new business, new entrepreneurship, if you can say two words, and then we have to, to, to close, but uh, you can mention why you went in that direction from chemistry. I read, a, I read an article in a newspaper telling uh, Professor Shetman uh, sound like more business professor than a Nobel Prize winner in chemistry. No. It was just one, but the others are okay. It's not, it, I didn't divert from my work to do technological entrepreneurship, but I'm from Israel and I am a patriot and I try to do things that will help the country. And uh, 28 years ago, I realized that we need more technological entrepreneurship in the country and in the world. And so, at the day that I became a uh, full professor, which, which is the highest rank uh, in, at the Technion, turned out it, it's not the highest, now I have the highest, but I decided now I can do whatever I want, and I started a class of technological entrepreneurship at the Technion, my university in Haifa. It has been, and I teach it for 27 years now, a very successful class, many hundreds of students in my class. And over that period of time, Israel became a startup nation. And there was an article in Financial Time, you can Google Shechtman FT, and they claim that I'm one of the fathers of the success in entrepreneurship in the country. But it's not based on, on just my work. The, the people, the, the, uh, the national character is such that it calls for entrepreneurship. Israelis are very entrepreneurial. And, uh, while as before, the Jewish mother's the dream was that, that her son will be the doctor. Now, at least in Israel, she wants her son to be a startup uh, manager, and he will make, make a startup. You can create, and, and I talk a lot about it all over the world because I want to promote it all over the world. Whenever they, about 50% of my talks around the world are on technological entrepreneurship. How can you foster in a country technological entrepreneurship, which in my opinion is a key to world peace and prosperity. Because if you look at the countries that have those internal fights now, terrible fights in the Middle East and in Africa and in other countries, there's one thing common to all of them. They are poor countries. People are disenchanted and the, and the people are poor. When people are poor, they're never quiet. They, they, they start to fight. Entrepreneurship in general, technological entrepreneurship in particular, can make a difference throughout the world. And the name of my talk is usually Technological Entrepreneurship, a Key to World Peace and Prosperity. Many people listen to my talk. So Nobel Prize winners have always a hobby or a second profession. In your case, it's publication besides science. In uh, Professor Shetman, is entrepreneurship. So I wish you successes in both the fields and I wish you success in continuing achieving more success. I don't know wh what you can achieve more, but uh, probably the best thing to achieve all the goals. So thank you again. Thank you very much. I wish you enjoy the stay here and then uh, uh, hopefully we'll see you on another occasion. But uh, I really thank you on behalf of all the attendees. Thank you. You're a politician. Although they are started this by saying I'm going to change the reality, they couldn't. Yeah, well, I think.
for the both of us, our opinions are too strong. <laughs> and inevitably, people are going to disagree with people who have strong opinions. So, okay. Whereas politicians have to say nice things to please everyone. Everyone. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you. Thank you again.